or part. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. It was a Saturday night uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I guess now. We had been away. Sarah and I were traveling by ourselves. We were away with the staff uh, up in uh, Tennessee, and we were coming back. Uh, The plan was to leave Tennessee mountains and make our way back to to Greenville to get in bed at, you know, a reasonable hour. And we hit the uh, Asheville airport, you know, that stretch where the road narrows and there's always construction seemingly, and traffic was stopped. And I mean the kind of stopped where people are getting out of their cars and walking up to see if they can figure out what's happened, just kind of chilling on the, the side, it was stopped. Fast forward four hours and about 1.30 in the morning, we arrived back home after sitting on 26 for way longer than I wanted to and way after my bedtime, which, by the way, is about 9.30, all right? Uh, 1.30 a.m. is far too late. It was a miserable experience, and even in the misery of that experience, we had the benefit of technology and uh, things like Waze apps, you know, where you can pull up and dial in. How long is it going to take me to break free? Imagine the chaos some uh, decades ago when you're just stuck. You have no way to know when, how, where will I get out. Being stuck in traffic is a miserable experience. Being stuck in life is way worse. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would, by the power of your Spirit, give us grace to see this morning places where we are stuck. And would you appropriately prod us to grow in grace. We ask for help to that end. We recognize that we lack the internal strength to muster up the energy to do that in our own power. And so would you, by your spirit, bring conviction and change to each of us as is appropriate to please you. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. The picture of traffic is a good image of our text this morning, which is Hebrews 5 verse 11 through 15 or 14. I'll show you in a minute why I asked for Ephesians 4 to be read as our introductory text, but we're going to look as we continue this series called Jesus is Better, looking at these few verses. You notice we're slowing down the pace, and this pace, this slowing down is going to highlight for us, allow us to, to drop in on what may be a familiar paragraph from this book for many of you. It points to this reality of spiritual immaturity. In fact, your text probably gives you some indication of that, a a warning against immaturity, most of your Bibles say. We might say it to frame my introduction, uh, a warning against being spiritually stuck. Have you, you ever felt that way? Like you know spiritually the, the destination you're heading, but you just can't seem to get out of your own way to get there. Or like other people are moving towards that destination at a far more rapid pace than you are. Or perhaps you can look back and see seasons of momentum or direction spiritually, seasons of zeal and change, but right now you just feel stagnant. Such was seemingly the case at the time of this address, that this address was given to the Hebrews. And what makes the situation all the more dicey is not merely that they were stuck, that they weren't moving towards a destination, but that they lacked any internal fortitude to actually change that. So the author, the speaker, comes with a very direct challenge to them this morning, and in turn to us, I'll read the entirety of this section, Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. We have a great deal to say about this. It's difficult to explain since you've become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, 
for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Draw your attention to the first verse there in that section, to verse 11. The speaker seemingly breaks off midstream. It's a flow of thought. Look back in your text. Look in verse 9. He mentions a declaration by God about a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now flip over in your Bibles to the start of chapter 7. Actually, if you back up, starting in verse 13, there's a bit of a lengthy introduction to the section about Melchizedek, but you'll see pretty much the entirety of chapter 7. And then moving even into chapter 8 is a fuller exposition of this high priest and his role. Now, I'm not saying this is how it went down, but this is how it goes down in my mind as one who preaches and speaks to groups regularly. He gets to verse 10. And he's beginning the train of thought that's going to get us to Melchizedek and explaining his high priestly role and how Jesus intersects with that. And he begins to talk, he begins to explain verse 10, and then he's like, Ugh, I, I really want to keep going, but, but I can't. He steps aside and there, there's something I want to say to you. But we can't go there yet because I've got to, I've got to do this kind of intermission. So 5.11 down to 6.12 functions for us as a bit of an intermission. You can see if we're kind of placing the pulpit as a, uh, uh, this central role of exposing the word, he's kind of stepping aside. And these verses are pastoral. They're intimate. They reveal knowledge of the audience to whom he's speaking. And they are very direct. He's going to come back around to what he's intending to say. But before we get there, notice what he says in verses 11 and 12. He says five things. You're too lazy. You wouldn't understand. You should be teachers. You need somebody to teach you the basics of the faith again. And you can't handle solid food because you're still drinking milk. How's that for direct? I told you last week that I put someone to sleep for the first time. Um, I don't think I've ever had someone angrily storm out of a sermon before, which sets up really nicely if somebody wants to storm out this morning, everybody will awkwardly look at you and you'll fulfill uh, my, uh, my future uh, warning. I've never had somebody angrily storm out, but imagine what would happen in you if I did what this speaker is doing. Imagine your impulses if I followed the example this morning. I'm teaching, I hit a point, I stop. And I say, man, I'd really like to go forward, but I can't because you all are lazy. You all are too slow to understand. You all are spiritual infants when you should be teachers. You all need somebody to teach you again. I imagine that in many of you, there's even in hearing me, even though I set it up humorously, there's this impulse to who's going to talk to me like that? I want you to consider idea number one this morning. Spiritual laziness often requires outside intervention. Spiritual laziness often requires outside intervention. Here's what I mean by that. I almost use spiritual complacency as my header this morning, because doesn't that sound so much nicer? Spiritually complacent people. Who likes to be called lazy? But I figure it's best to replicate what the text itself says. And this is the language bracket of this entire section. He's talking to lazy people. So look in 511. You too have become too lazy to understand. To, uh, 511. Then look down at the end of this section, so the, the brackets of it, look in 612. So that you won't become lazy. To be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. So... There's lazy people, and he's explaining this section in the hopes that they'll stop being lazy. Spiritual laziness is the focus. And in these intervening verses, he's going to say, who's lazy? Why are they lazy? How do they know they're lazy? And what happens if they remain lazy? These are all questions that this section is going to answer. And while we may not like to hear it, we often, in fact, I would suggest most of the time, need someone external to ourselves to call out our spiritual laziness. For most of us, 
we know the implications of spiritual laziness. Water that sits in a kiddie pool all summer, you leave it alone, it's just going to get gross, right? We know the same is true with our hearts. Without vibrant movement of life-giving water, we're going to get gross. We're going to crash in on ourselves. Our souls are going to sour. So we know it's true that we can be stuck. We know it's not good to stay stuck. And infuriatingly, in most cases, we know the steps we need to take in order to get unstuck. The process of spiritual growth is not hidden. It's not some mystical method reserved for a select few. It's a tried and true process of abiding with God in his word and prayer, engaging with God's people deeply through his church, and pouring ourselves out in love and service to others. Isn't this what makes the process of spiritual growth super frustrating? You know you are stuck. You know how to get unstuck. You know what will happen if you stay stuck, but you still stay stuck. So what happens? God in his grace sends outside help. He sends people like our speaker in this text this morning who call out to us in a meddling kind of way to reveal our spiritual apathy. And in this way, this reality reminds us of the truth of the gospel as a whole. We know that sin enslaves. We know that we need a remedy for sin. We know that if we stay in our sin, we're destined to a Christless eternity. But without the outside intervention of the Spirit of God through the Word of God, we can't repent and believe. So God sent outside intervention to reveal our need for spiritual help. And this process continues throughout our lives. As outside voices from pulpits and classrooms, over cups of coffee and gymnasiums and workplaces and neighborhood playgrounds, remind you of the call to persevere in the faith. And God does this for our good. If this is true, if the author is modeling something for us that we, we know we need, which is some outside voices to speak into our lives, to prod us out of spiritual apathy, let me invite you to consider two points of application just quickly, kind of embedded in the sermon this morning. First, kindly, lovingly, but directly call other people to grow. Kindly, lovingly, but directly, call other people to grow. When you are in a position where you have eyes on spiritual apathy in another person, grow in the grace and the insight to kindly, winsomely, graciously see your voice as a gift of God to invite them to grow. There's a big difference between calling someone out and calling them up. What I'm inviting you to is not calling them out but calling those in the church up to godliness and holiness, obedience to Christ. And then secondly and correspondingly, humbly receive the correction others give. When people ask questions to you, when people press you to take steps of obedience, when the pulpit steps on your toes just a bit, Assume the best about those who are speaking that word and receive their message as a challenge from God to grow. When the proclaimed word presses you, do more than think in your head, man, that was a good sermon. But say, what would it look like for me to submit myself to the truth that I heard this morning? Why is this so important? Outside voice that prods us out of spiritual laziness. Idea number two, because spiritual laziness harms the church. Spiritual laziness harms the church. Look again in verses 11 and 12. So he says, he wants to say more about Melchizedek and the priesthood. It's difficult to explain because you've become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody else to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. What's interesting here is the you in this section. I've tried to highlight it uh, on this slide. This week, a few of our ladies from the church went away to a conference in Indianapolis, and there one of the speakers was making this point about, uh, in relation to to Jesus' call that uh, we're the light of the world. 
And she said rightly that this is not singularly you individual Christian are the light of the world, but collectively you all as Christians are the light of the world. So you don't feel the weight of responsibility solely on you, but it rests on the collective people of God. Well, here the same idea applies, but it's uniquely in a more accusatory form. It's not just you singular are too lazy to understand, but it's an entire group of people marked by spiritual infancy. Have you ever thought about this, the the application of this text this way? By virtue of the fact that God has organized his people into little bodies that we call local churches, we share a common spiritual health report. Now, certainly we're all answerable to God individually for repentance and faith and belief, And yet, we see played out all over the scriptures an exhortation to the body, to the church as a whole, either their negligence or positively their zeal for the Lord. The exhortation to the Corinthian church. Think about the conclusions made in Revelation 2 and 3 to the churches, say, in Ephesus or Laodicea. This is collectively, you are lukewarm. So I'm going to spew you out. Here the author critiques not merely individuals within these churches, as Paul will often do when he names them specifically. But here the spiritual maturation is traced at a congregational level. Uh, The people here, though not maybe specifically to one local church, the people who are gathered, these Hebraic believers, and he says, you all are demonstrating this laziness. Perhaps it's a too soon faux pas here, but spiritual complacency is highly contagious. Spiritual laziness is is highly contagious. It spreads and it influences those that are around you. It tends to clump up. It tends to move from person to person. And given enough time, spiritual apathy will take over communities like kudzu. And we've all seen this, right? Maybe you've attended a church for some time, or perhaps you visit a church from your youth, and you go back and you're just grieved. Why? There's no zeal. There's no love for the Lord. There's no submission to the word. There's no tears for the work of mission. The people collectively have become lazy. How does that happen? Spiritual laziness happens at an individual level. It harms the corporate body. There's two manifestations of this in our text. There is teaching that they should be able to understand that they won't. There's teaching that they should be able to understand that they they will not. Notice in verse 11, there's something I want to say to you, but I can't say it yet. And specifically in verse 11, Notice the the contrast. So, I have a great deal to say to you about this, and it's difficult to explain because the ideas are really complex, and they're only for those with really great intellect who are able to comprehend them. Is that what the text says? No. Here's what the text says. I've got a great deal to say. It's difficult to explain, not because of your intellect, but because you're too lazy to understand. This is not an intellectual question, it's a maturation issue. The the issue is not primarily intellectual, it's moral. You have become lazy, not because of a lack of intellectual rigor, but because of immaturity. I, I can't say what I wanna say clearly because you wouldn't understand it even if I said it clearly because you are spiritually lazy, so the author says. This is the difference between trying to instruct a child and an adult. There are things you want to tell a two-year-old, but you can't. Why? Because they're not intellectually ready for the content. But an adult? The intellect is present, though their will may not be. They won't do the work needed to understand. So, and here's the important point, they're robbed of the edification that could come from the deep teaching of God's word. 
They, by their laziness, by their moral laziness, are robbed. They're those who want to impart truth, but they can't because the people are too lazy to understand. And then conversely, there's teaching they should give, but they will not. There's teaching they should receive, they can't, or they want. And there's teaching they should give, but they don't. Look in verse 12. He says, mark of maturation, you should be teaching others. But we got to spend time coming back to these basic principles. We got to teach you the principles of God's revelation again. Let's start with the idea of basic principles there. Some of your translations say elemental principles here. We're picking up on a play from, from Greek philosophy where we have these kind of elemental foundational principles, earth, fire, water, just the foundational matter from which everything is formed. And he says we're having to come back to those foundational matters about God. I think it's defined for us in 6, 1, and 2. Look forward to chapter 6, 1, and 2. I think this is all packed together. Uh, we're segmenting a bit, but he points forward to these principles, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, number one, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. So here, in my own words, elemental principles relate to the inability of the law to save, the necessity of faith in God, the process of sanctification, the hope of new life and the resurrection and the reality of eternal judgment. Given again, the foundational principles, inability of the works of the law to save you, the necessity of faith in God, the process of sanctification, how one get grows in godliness, the hope of the new life and the resurrection to come, and the reality of God's judgment. These matters are the essence the foundational principles of God's revelation. But notice, notice here, and this is an important caveat. It's not that those elemental principles are bad, right? It's not that they're bad. In fact, church, we should continue to come back to those foundational principles the way a skilled athlete returns to the foundational drills of their sport, and particularly in churches like ours, made up of so many people at different levels and different spiritual places, it's impossible to get away from the need to return to these elemental principles over and over and over again. And even for the spiritually mature among us, when we return back to those elemental principles, they should encourage your heart. Uh, one writer, uh, Dr. Harold Best, rightly points out, spiritually mature people are easily edified. Spiritually mature people are easily edified. That means even when we return back to ideas that you're like, I'm familiar with, when somebody communicates the truth of the gospel to you, you feel your soul warmed. So what's the issue? It's not that we're having to return back to those, but the fact that you are regressing such that you have to be reminded of these truths over and over again when what you should be doing is teaching those truths to other people. Those foundational principles should be flowing through you in such a way, verse 12, that you could take, teach the basic principles of God's revelation. But instead, we're having to teach them to you when you should be teaching others. Now, the issue here is not an official like office of teaching. It's not indicating for us that like ministry from a pulpit that happens week in and week out. The idea here is commending the word to other people over coffee, at a park with kids, to a neighbor, in the gym, through intentional discipleship relationships. Those well acquainted with the foundational truths of the gospel should be able to instruct others in those very foundational principles. And when you don't, you are robbing the church of spiritual good. When you should be teaching... You should be instructing, you should be helping, and you're not. You're bringing the waterline down among us all. So you might ask, okay, Madge, you said this is kind of a meddling text, and God's kind of direct here, pastor at CFC for 15 years. How do you think we're doing? You said spiritual maturity is a group project, so what do we need to hear right now? Overall, 
I would want to shine the spotlight on this later idea more than the former idea. As a general rule, I do not find myself teaching in the pulpit having to say, I can't give this to you because you can't handle it. However, we have a fairly educated church. We have a church that prioritizes the word of God. And an oft unintended byproduct of that type of church can be passivity among members who depend on others to teach them what they themselves should be teaching others. Might I invite you just to consider how many sermons you've heard, how many Bible studies you've attended, how many conferences you've gone to over the years. There is so much latent potential in our church to help other people follow Jesus. I like Mark Dever's definition here of discipleship, just helping people mature. He says, deliberately doing good to help somebody else follow Jesus. Discipleship is deliberately doing good to others, which includes teaching and instructing them for the sake of helping them follow Jesus. Friends, this is something that any adult Christian can do and should do. If you look back and there are no people in the wake of your life, that is a check engine light that suggests you are spiritually immature. Why? Why is this so important? It harms the church. We need some outside help. It's going to harm us. We don't, because thirdly, spiritual laziness will take you somewhere you don't want to go. We got to have outside help intervening because it would harm us all if we get infested with spiritual laziness. And it would take you individually and us collectively to a place that, that we don't want to go. Consider the end of this passage. You need milk, not solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with a message about righteousness because he is an infant. Solid food is for the mature those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Here's a place that we, we would know there's some interaction between the speaker of this uh, text and Paul, either Paul's building on the speaker, either the speaker is Paul, the, the speaker's building on Paul, Paul's building on the speaker. There's some interplay because we see this same imagery used in Paul's writing. This is 1 Corinthians 3. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. Not like any good illustration. The picture really needs little explanatory content, right? We know infants drink milk. Adults eat solid food. Specifically here in verse 13 of our passage, he says, milk drinkers are inexperienced with the message about righteousness. It's kind of an odd phrase, isn't it? A little bit cryptic. I think there are two likely references here, and I think they're both true. Inexperienced with the message about righteousness, one means the message about righteousness refers to the righteousness of Christ. Here, the mention of Melchizedek is helpful. His name, some of your Bibles say down in the footnote, means king of righteousness. King, so, as we said, he's kind of stepping aside from this on explanation of how Christ's righteousness exceeds the righteousness of this great Old Testament high priest. And he says you're inexperienced with it. I can't go on to describe Jesus' righteousness and how it far exceeds the king of righteousness, and how the righteousness of Jesus is given to you because you're too lazy to understand all of that. You're a milk drinker. And two, the message of righteousness refers to the sanctified Christian life. It refers to a life of righteousness. One that is marked by the ability, verse 14, to distinguish between good and evil. And it's there I want to focus our attention for a moment. Let's focus on one aspect of the illustration between milk and solid food. Why not give, why should you not give infants solid food? There are many reasons, right? 
Kid might choke. You don't give him a steak. You don't give a one-month-old a hunk of steak because the child might choke or teeth. You don't give a child a rack of ribs because those baby gums are going to have trouble with that rack of ribs. But the big issue seems to be one of digestion. A, a kid, their, their physical makeup, an infant, is not ready to process that. They're not willing to absorb it and digest it and use it to propel life. Adult Christians, on the other hand, digest meat so that they're able to distinguish between good and evil. In other words, meat changes them. More than merely their intellectual capacity, it, it changes the way they process and move through life. This is what mature Christians do. They have the ability to distinguish between good and evil. I think this happens at two levels. Distinguishing good and evil in terms of teaching. They can distinguish good teaching from bad teaching. Spirits are trained. They can digest that. They can look through the latest craze of the book that sells 100 zillion copies when it really shouldn't, right? They can say there's some holes there. They can hear a, a, a new worship song and say with discernment, say, is that articulating truths about God or am I saying things that are they're mature in their understanding of God? And they're discerning good and evil living. True and false teaching and good and evil living. They can process the host of matters that build on the Bible's teaching, but the Bible doesn't address specifically. It requires Christian discernment, the ability to take and process. And friends, perhaps before I comment on the milk drinkers, just a word of warning to those of you who are on a carnivore diet. If you're a meat eater among us, this process of digestion and using that which comes to you is vital lest you become one who knowledge puffs up. Here's a direct knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The outlet of our maturation of our meat eating is not to puff us up and isolate us from people, but it's to humble us and press us into relationships such that we teach and edify the body, such that we build up. The outcome of our maturation is not superiority, but service. How do you know a mature Christian among us? Look for the person who's doing the things that nobody else wants to do. Look for the one who does not laud their intellect to lord it over, but rather uses that to build up. But that's not the main focus. The author is attempting to not exhort meat eaters. He's begging the milk drinkers to grow up. He's, he's begging them to not stay there. And you might notice, even in the reading of this, the tie back to the garden. The mark of human sin, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, indicative of the choice that Adam made. To eat of the tree was to prove his inability to heed God's word and do what was right. Infants have no such discernment. They are not trained to discern between good and evil. Paul warns what happens to those who are like this in the text that Micah read for us. Remember this. So that you're no longer children. What happens to children? They just get tossed to and fro. Like, like a, a ship and massive ocean waves by every wind of teaching, by every human cunning or cleverness, techniques of deceit. That frames some of your friends, doesn't it? Every two to three years, zealous about a different theological tribe and bent, moving to and fro on every deceitful scheme. The point here is that while it may feel like you're merely spiritually stuck, the reality is you aren't stuck. You are moving. You are regressing. And you are headed for destruction. 
Remember that we're isolating a smaller section and a much larger argument. Here's where we're going next week. Pack a pew Sunday. Bring all your friends. It's impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they're re-crucifying the Son of God, and they're holding him up to contempt. Contempt, I'm sorry. For the ground that drinks the rain, that often falls on it, and often produces vegetation useful for those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed. And in the end, it will be burned. Here is the danger. Stagnation, infancy, laziness is a natural precursor to falling away. We tend to read this as if the author is picturing people who drink milk for years and years and years and kind of enter heaven with the bottle in their mouth. This is not what the author has in mind. Milk versus meat is a watershed of authentic conversion. On the one side are those who repent of laziness, eat meat, and grow. On the other side are those who regress in laziness, settle for milk, and given enough time, will fall away. You either grow up or you fall away. You either are sanctified or you apostatize. And live long enough, you see it all the time. We see it more times than we care to admit. The friend who was once seemingly zealous for God, his word, his church, who falls away. Perhaps they outwardly renounce the faith. Perhaps they post a thought piece on your social media platform of choice. Perhaps they continue to attend church, but it's mere religious performance, and they know it, and you do as well. Perhaps they just shift the focus. What was once church is now their career, their hobbies. They might look back and they refer to it as their religious phase. Or they might lump themselves in with the modern notion of a deconstructionist. Perhaps an under-discussed reality lurking beneath the surface of those case study presented for us in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. They simply were lazy. They settled for milk. They got complacent. They overlooked genuine affection for the Lord and preference for external forms of religion. To us on the outside, it looks like their apostasy happened in a moment. But the reality is they were heading for destruction for years and they were too lazy to do anything about it. And the question this text demands for us is, will that be your story? In a room of this many people, it most assuredly will for some of you lest you heed the exhortation of our speaker from Hebrews this morning, who has already told you what to do. Remember back in chapter 4? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about a later day. Therefore, a Sabbath remains for the people of God. For the person who entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore then make every effort to enter that rest so that we will not fall into that same pattern of disobedience. The word of God is living and it is effective and it is sharper than double-edged, any double-edged sword. It penetrates as far as the separation of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature, even the spiritually apathetic, lazy, is hidden from him. All things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to him, to whom we must give an account. Today, receive the word of the Lord as an external exhortation to confront your spiritual laziness, to repent of it, to claim the forgiveness that is found through Christ's good sacrifice.
redouble your efforts to use what you receive to build up the body such that you do not careen towards destruction. Let's pray to that end this morning. Our pattern is to give a minute or two of personal private reflection for you to pray, for you to ask God's spirit to challenge and to provoke you. After that time of private reflection, I'll voice a prayer for us and then we'll receive from the Lord's table. Father, we receive as a gift your kindness to expose our laziness, not in a condemning, heavy-handed fashion, but in and through the winsome kindness we've received through Christ, that you, knowing our spiritual apathy, our adulterous hearts, our proneness to laziness. That you, as we sang earlier, completely knew those things and yet completely loved us through Christ. We pray that the beauty of your pursuing love would draw us to ongoing repentance such that we consistently renounce laziness and pursue maturity so that the church is built up and we don't fall away. And we do ask, even in this space, for those that we love that are careening toward destruction. Father, might you, through the activity of your spirit, might you break through the hardened exterior walls of the human heart And would you give grace to see clearly, to repent and believe? Might you, as you've done throughout history, revive us? And might you save from destruction many of our family and friends who we see pictured in this passage? And today, Father, we ask as we want to heed your instruction from your word that we would be teachers and not merely those who consume. Father, we ask that you would, by your spirit, give us opportunities to multiply the voice of this text into the lives of others. Through phone calls and text messages and conversations in our neighborhoods this afternoon, would we be bold and courageous such that we take the elemental principles of the gospel and use them to build up others. And we ask that you would give us the perseverance to do that for the rest of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.